With a distinctive ping when discharging an emptied end block clip, the M1 Garand has solidified its place as a rifle of legend in the mid 30s to late 50s. And as such, it became a common place for the World War, serving as the standard service rifle for the United States during World War II all the way up until the Korean War and had limited service even during the Vietnam War. But with it being such a huge part of history and the time frame, it's no surprise that it's a fan favorite in games as well. And with the reintroduction to World War II in the Call of Duty franchise, we've seen a dive back into the past to be able to use such weaponry. With this not being the first time the franchise has gone back to the era, exactly how do the rifles compare? Let's take a look at the M1 Garand then versus now. So the last time that we heard from our old friend the M1 Garand was in World at War. Now granted we've had variations throughout the past couple of games. An example, it was a classic weapon in Infinite Warfare. It was a supply drop weapon within Advanced Warfare. It had the MX Garand in Black Ops 3, but the true last time that we saw a World War II M1 Garand was in World at War. So we're gonna be taking a look at and comparing the World at War variation with the World War II variation that we saw as recently as this weekend's beta. Now, let's start out basic. Let's go with the statistical breakdown of the World at War variation compared to the World War II variation. So, starting us off with the classic, the M1 Garand of World at War ended up having a damage of 45 to 35, a drop off of a two shot headshot up close, three shot body up close to a little bit further off in that range drop off once you drop down to 35. It had a max rate of fire of of 444 RPM, a magazine or end block clip of eight shots, the recoil was moderate, and the level of unlock was 17. Now you'll come to find that a lot of these features are the same in Call of Duty World War II, but there are a few that do in fact differ. So let's transition now into what Call of Duty World War II holds for those same statistical breakdowns. The damage, while I was unable to pinpoint the exact numbers from gameplay testing, it seems consistent with the 45 to 30 drop off. Now, whether or not the multipliers are changed around a little bit to be less than 1.5 for a headshot or more than 1.1 for anywhere else on the body, that'll make a difference as well in pinpointing the exact damage until we have the game code to end up seeing exactly what it is, but the rate of fire is around 370 RPM, which is a notable difference compared to that of the World at War M1 Garand. We've already seen fire rate caps on some of the pistols within Call of Duty World War II, and whether or not semi-automatic rifles are included in that fire rate cap, that's something that we've yet to really see, simply because we haven't had too much experience outside of the M1 Garand. But moving on, the magazine or end block clip is again eight shots, matching up with that of the World at War counterparts. The recoil is relatively moderate, and the level of unlock differs in that of it's a default weapon rather than a level unlock of 17. Now, of course, you still need to use an unlock token, so you'll need to get to at least rank two to end up being able to use it, but for the time being, it's much easier year to obtain. Now, where some things outside of statistically will vary greatly are some things you'll be able to pick up immediately. The most notable probably is that of the iconic ping noise whenever you discharge your end block clip. If you examine them side by side, they are very similar, but the World at War counterpart has a little bit higher pitch to the ping as compared to that of the World at War II counterpart. This is something that I've seen a lot of different buzz about in terms of just nitpicking the nitty gritty, and of course, that's something that has been iconic throughout the Call of Duty series, but that could easily be chalked up to the methods in which the audio is recorded, the capability and clarity of files now compared to 10 years ago, a lot of different factors could be going into it, but it comes down to ultimately what you think of it, how much it really differs in your mind. While there is still a little bit of a noticeable difference, some people may care a little bit more than others, but ultimately the general accuracy is still there. Another thing you might notice right off the bat are the reload animations, whereas simply in World at War, you would end up loading your end block clip and would snap back into action almost immediately. In the World War II counterpart, you end up pushing forward and cocking it manually. Now, once again, both are accurate. They're just represented in a little bit of a different manner, but ultimately, once again, a little bit of a discrepancy in terms of how one worked in one game 
versus the other. One thing additionally with the reload is that in some games in Call of Duty, you can't actually reload your M1 until you use up every single shot in that M block clip for it to discharge. However, both in World at War and in World War II, you can discharge that clip to replace it with a full one at any point in time. There's no inability to decide when you want to reload compared to when you have to reload. And perhaps the biggest in terms of the changes goes back once again to the audio, not this time dealing with the end block clip discharge ping, but instead with the fire audio in general. In World at War, it had a lot more of a, say, twang to the sound, whereas in World War II, it has a deeper booming resonance in terms of the depth of the fire audio itself. This seems like a common trend with some weapons fire audio in World War II overall, where it's a little bit more deeper, it's more booming, it doesn't necessarily have that higher pitch to it, but nonetheless, it is still a major change to the weapon, and one that doesn't necessarily affect gameplay, but aesthetically is a bit of a curveball to players that have been using the weapon for years now. But other than that, the only real other differences noticeably are a little bits of a character or grit added on to the World at War version, with more scratches, more markups on the Garand than that of the World at War II counterpart. But overall, the weapon making its classic and iconic return to the franchise in its era in which it was most prominent it's something that a lot of fans will definitely really want to get their hands on, and it's a formidable weapon for Call of Duty World War II, something that's a viable choice for every game use in terms of when you can play it again with the beta and inevitably the full release come this November. But that said, that's where we're gonna wrap it up here at this one. Wanted to give you guys a little bit of a comparison of then versus now. And so that said, hopefully you guys enjoyed. Let me know your thoughts down there in the comment section down below. Not only any of your thoughts here on the weapon then versus now, but also well, what weapon would you guys like to see me cover next? I'd love to ultimately turn this into a series. I think it'd be a lot of fun to take a look at where we've been compared to where we're going in Call of Duty. And of course, a little bit of just weapon history in general. So that said, hopefully you guys enjoyed. And if you guys did, make sure you drop a like down below. And of course, if you guys are new to the channel, make sure you guys subscribe to stay updated with everything we have here regarding Call of Duty World War II. We're gonna be killing it with the content come the second week of the beta and of course into the full release. So if any of that interests you, make sure you guys stick it right here up on the channel. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a beat. And finally, if you guys want to follow me over on Twitter, that is the best place to get characters from outside of YouTube. Practically live on Twitter. So if you guys want to strike up a conversation, ask me a question, whatever it may be, link is down there in the description below. But all that said and out of the way, hope you guys have a fantastic day. Thanks so much for watching. My name is Espresso. I'll see you guys later. Take care and peace.